Welcome to week seven, part B. It's time to go video. Now, understandably, video has been a central part of the e-marketing course delivery platform. So consequently, one of the things that we're going to be looking at here is a set of elements that also meta recurse. I chose to use video as my platform and my distribution mechanism because I saw a value in it as a means to communicate to you as my students. What we are also going to do is just make a couple of clarifications. Uh, big shout out to XKCD for this. I have recorded these videos in a combination of horizontal and vertical. Uh, my side of the screen, I'm in vertical. Uh, technically, I could possibly pull off a sort of YouTube-y, um, TikTok-style vertical, but I'm a great believer in 16 by 9 aspect ratios, and I like recording things in the horizontal. So I stacked the PowerPoint presentation off to one side, and I stacked myself off to the other. Of interest to me is the horizontal-vertical split is something I've noticed with monitors and computer monitors that we can do rotation. So you can have a monitor rotated to provide vertical, so you can read an A4 layout. I'm waiting for TVs to really move into that and then we start getting some interesting opportunities in video where if you combine video aspect ratio and a small motor in the back of the uh, television so that it could rotate to the appropriate framework, we've got some opportunities for embedded content and storytelling that aren't there yet. For us, the purpose of a video-focused site is that it is streaming, it's curation to limited file download. So we're thinking about our Netflix and our YouTube and our Vimo. We're also thinking more in terms of playlists, likes and subscriptions. So whilst you can do video on Twitter and you can do video on Instagram, that's not their primary use case. That's not their primary purpose. Even if Twitter's monetization platform really likes you to use their video feature, that's not currently the core purpose of a Twitter platform. The other aspect to this is you have the capacity to upload, so a Vimo or a YouTube, or you have the capacity to share, again a YouTube, where the element, the dominant element here is that it's moving images plus audio. Now we could do audio free video, whereas I think that that is not its primary purpose. So audio and video are merged here, whereas in audio, video was extracted, there was no image part. Also, I'd just like to say that there is a component here where within the course, I am using the Echo 360 platform to distribute video. I am using the uh, Microsoft Office Stream platform, and I'm using YouTube. The reason I'm using the three different platforms is both experimental. I'm trying out to see if Stream will work for us this semester. I know that YouTube works and YouTube has a certain feature set that I want to make use of. And also, Echo 360 has a certain feature set in terms of geolocation and access over uh, the ANU VPN and the ANU IP range. So, when we have the opportunity, you can focus on a single video channel or you can use, where there is a purpose and there is a point, you can use a multiple parallel distribution channel. With 360, Echo 360, there are file download options. With YouTube, there's no download option, it's all streaming. And we haven't really got the hang of uh, the Office stream platform, so I can't say for certain either way. Now, I'm going to mention a couple of bits of software like I do at the start of these shows. I really want to shout out to VLC. If you don't have this installed, get on it. First of all, it's a really robust video player. A lot of codecs, a lot of capacity to play just about any file type that's out there. 
It also plays audio, so as much as I love Winamp, I tend to have VLC, well, VLC is on my shortcuts bar, so I tend to run it as my audio and video player. It also has some production capacity. And one of the things about the way the course content is created for this subject is I record the videos in OBS, which we'll talk about in a moment. I edit it in Premiere, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the Premiere master file is compressed through the conversion function in VLC, so it's in a smaller package for upload and distribution. VLC also can record screens and can record and can capture video. So it's a more robust toolkit than just simply a playback, but it's also a really good playback device. So I've mentioned OBS. This is what we are recording in at the moment. The OBS platform is really useful. And I'd like to thank the class of 2020, the cohort, uh, e-marketing cohort of 2020, because a number of the students who were in that cohort were using Twitch and doing Twitch gaming, which encouraged me to experiment with the OBS platform. And it was a, I learned from my students, and it's one of my great joys about teaching, is the reason I'm using OBS this year is I got to see it in operation and see the value of it and went, I could, I've got a vision I could co-create using OBS as my platform to record PowerPoint in one side and webcam in the other with the little overlay uh, that gives me the look and feel that I want to use. So I learned that in part from my students last year. So big shout out to the 2020 cohorts. The other video focus software that we're currently using in the subject, we're all familiar now with Zoom. We've been hosting our seminars through there. Teams is what I use for consultations uh, because of its strong interface and interaction with the rest of the Outlook portfolio. So Teams links into Microsoft Outlook, which hosts my calendar. My calendar is directly connected to the online booking form, which is available through the Wattle site. There's also the Twitch Studio Beta, which is a variant of the OBS, but I just, I like recording to disk and I like using OBS to do that. Now, I will say I've gone out of my way to always offer an open source or free variant of any of the software packages that we've talked about. OpenShot I haven't used because I have a copy of Adobe Premiere that's paid for by the university for the express purpose of me creating this type of content. So I use Premiere I also have a track record in using Premiere for a number of <coughs> decades, number of years now, and it's my software of choice. I'm also aware that Final Cut Pro is available for the Mac, but I haven't seen, uh, I haven't used a Mac for a very long time, so I can't speak to it either. But functionally, what matters is when you are looking for a video editing package, you are looking for it to be non-destructive so that when you edit a file, the master file stays in its full format. And you're looking for a video package that can do nonlinear plus conversion. You want to be able to output in high resolution and you want to be able to bring in a wide range of source material. So have it accept all those different component parts and then produce one single file at the outcome which is why Premiere is my go-to. It can incorporate MP3s, it can incorporate JPEGs, it can incorporate uh, PNG files, move formats, AVI, pretty much everything this side of an Excel file in a Word document, and I haven't tried that. So, let's talk about video as a concept. Now for me in e-marketing, video is my distribution platform. It's, to me, it's the best way in which I can combine the PowerPoint visuals, my voice, and you know, myself as a parasocial connection to you as my students. For your projects, 
what it's worth doing is to think about the ways in which video could enhance the project. Now for me, I'm using, as well as these teaching uh, pre-recorded on-demand learning events, I created an instructional video for the assessment tasks, and I've used a number of other video types over time, including I've done walkthrough videos, I've done instructions, how-to guides. If you have a value offer, which under the SIVA framework would have a challenge under the access, video might be the way to show people how to access the value offer and showcase value in co-creation, showcase the use in a service, showcase the actions of turning the component parts into a final object. And to that end, this is why the value co-creation is really open, is I would like you to think inside the project you're running right now. Now, if you're using video, you're already on, you've, what is it? What's the video doing as your value offer? If you're not using video, what could it do to support you? So if you're running a Depop secondhand clothing store, why not take some short videos of your clothes in use, you know, model the clothes and the outfit, and then say, this outfit's for sale on Depop. If you run an Etsy store, or you've got a Shopify account, or you've got your own website, you can embed the video content, host it somewhere on a Vimo or a YouTube, put it into your project. So really explore this. I think this is a big opportunity to, ex as you start the second half of the semester, a chance to expand the value propositions inside your ongoing project. Now let's talk price and video. Uh, the way I see it here, it's free if the purpose of the video is advertising. If the purpose of the video is beyond advertising, or the, it's not just the message, then we start moving into other pricing structures. But functionally, this video isn't free because you've paid student fees in order to go and enroll in a subject to access the material. It's heavily cross-funded for those of you who are watching this on YouTube and not enrolled in my class. Uh, this video was brought to you by the Australian National University and basically it's free because they paid for it. Similarly, things like trailers for movies can be considered free. Where the purpose of the video is to promote a product that is then for sale somewhere else, for example, the Fast 9, seen in movies and streaming services around the world, it's still free. Where the purpose is to get an advertiser to buy an advertiser's product either through a direct click-through link or through a discount code or through some way of recognizing this content was brought to you and as a result of someone buying or acting on the call to action here, the creator of the content gets paid, then we're at freemium. So advertising supported content is freemium. Despite the fact we call it free to air TV, it's freemium to air TV. Advertising supported content sits here. Premium content is locked behind a paywall. And there's a wide range of services that do pay access. I will take two notes here. One is that where you pay to access the content minus the advertising is a premium service. Ironically, YouTube, the leading creators of advertising that gets in the way of your video, offering a service that allows you to take advertising away from your video. <sighs> Hello, for $10 a month, we'll take away the harm that we're causing. It's a little standover, merchandish, gangsterish, but it's, they're getting away with it. The second place where there's paywall involved is the idea of subscription. Now, YouTube has its join function, its community function, but I'd like to emphasize the idea of the Patreon, where your patrons subscribe to this account with a monthly fee, and in return, they either get access to exclusive video, behind the scenes content, locked away on the Patreon, through the Patreon platform, or that content is available free 
on a different platform, say you subscribe on Patreon to support the creation of these videos, you pay $7 a month, and those videos are distributed on YouTube openly for free with recognition of the sponsors, with recognition of the patrons. So there's a few different ways around here. Like I said, there are a number of services that are available to charge money for videos. And this is where you've really got to understand what your value proposition is for your video and where it's best distributed that suits both the pricing you want to offer, the value proposition, and using that to then create the position and the positioning strategy. Now with regards to non-financial price, I've just I've mentioned the non-financial costs of production in a second column here because I want to talk to that briefly. I've got a 10 year track record of YouTube based education delivery. Prior to that, I have video recorded classes, I've used VHS tapes, I had a mate come in with who used to run a TV show up in Brisbane and he would record my lectures on a video cassette and we would make that available through a library. You could borrow it and watch the rewatch the lecture. I've been doing this for a long time. So when I speak to the production cast, I speak from experience and it's high energy. I burn a lot of energy to create this material, so the reason why I only half jokingly reference the Pepsi Max and the caffeine on the way through is that it is an intense process of talking to a camera and the method that I use I can do because I have a history with the, with the medium and also I'm okay with making mistakes. Uh, you will see me occasionally flub lines. Sometimes you'll see a cat, uh, cut as, yeah, if something goes terribly wrong, I will stop seeing and start again. But once I'm a few minutes down into the process, I try not to restart. I try and just roll out. But it also means that in the first instance, I record in real time. So if you want to do an hour's worth of content, then at the very least, you have an hour's commitment to creating that content. Realistically though, most of the YouTube channels that you will see are compressing significant volumes of content down into much shorter episodes. Much like the fact it takes several years to make a movie that runs for 90 minutes, the raw content that you create, then the post-production, then the editing and all the other elements that you need to do to create a video has a very high learning curve and a lot of energy expenditure, a lot of effort expenditure. You get better at it, but you also build teams. And the success of a YouTube, and this is one of the behind the scene things I want to flag, is I'm a one person operation. I do the videos, so it's me, the talking head, talking to you. I do the post-production, insofar as I do post-production on these videos all editing done in-house by me and the university was very kind to buy me a very expensive piece of technology because I can do this, because I've got this, this is the operand and operant resources kicking into gear. I have both the hardware necessary, the software necessary, plus I have the experience and the training to be able to create this. With that in mind, it's still more than real time. Now, in terms of consumption, switching over to your consumer, thinking about what your consumer is going to be doing, for the most part, video is consumed in real time. I know there's some of you out there who watch my videos in two times speed and one and a half times speed. And given I had a life goal of growing up to be Alvin and the Chipmunks, I'm okay with that. I think it's awesome. But not everyone does that. So when I, set a when I think about the time I want to allocate to a video, both in terms of recording it and producing it. I also think in terms of how long do I want to keep you in front of the screen engaged or trying to keep you engaged with my content. We also have a couple other aspects is that in one respect, video is low effort for consumption because you can sit back and there was the whole idea that you would tune in, tune out. 
get on front of the couch and just couch potato it you now uh, game check potato it that you are passive in your engagement with video that may or may not hold true anymore because we are able to do interactive events and as I'm speaking to you hopefully you've got your notes pads with you and you there's some form of proactive or active engagement but still, even with co-creation of value of sitting in an audience in a movie cinema, sitting in front of a couch, sitting on a couch, sitting in front of a couch, leaning against it, watching Netflix, the variable level of energy and effort required. We also have, uh, for most people, video fits into their lifestyle and their life cycle in terms of uh, a consumption platform or a consumption medium. You may find your preference for platform moving over time. Uh, mine has moved well away from TV and very much into YouTube, so I have a lot more opportunity for interest-driven, shorter, faster snippet approaches to content. And yet I'll still sit there and watch uh, a 45-minute video on someone doing wood turning. So don't think that your attention span gets shorter. You just find different things. And the last thing, the risk. Risk is quite substantive in video because of the time cost involved in the consumption. If you've walked out of a bad movie and gone, well, there's two hours of my life I won't get back. That is the statement of a, an unsatisfactory product costing you time which then becomes a risk for, do I want to do that again? Do I really want to waste my time on this? It is one of those facets. It's a much higher risk to produce video. It's one of the things that I accept at the start of each semester is I create many hours of content, I create it in advance, and then I don't look at the metrics because I don't really want to know if nobody's watched my stuff because it isn't actually the point of making the video. The point for me making this video is to put a resource there for you to potentially use. But everything is non-compulsory and voluntary and value-driven, so if you don't find the value from the video, that's okay. You're not the segment, you're not the target audience. Finally, the last thing I want to say in terms of production price, the price you pay for producing video is the parasocial connections, the micro celebrity, and a certain point after you've started creating content, you cease being the person and start becoming the product persona. People forget that you are in fact a real live entity and just start thinking of you as a product right, that can be discussed without there being a person behind it who has feelings that you become a character on the screen, you're an NPC in someone else's life. Uh, it is a challenge and not everyone wants that. So be thinking about it if you're going to embrace video. There are elements to the success that may actually come with a higher non-financial price to you as the producer than you would necessarily have expected. Okay, let's talk a little distribution, uh, the ways in which you can get content from point A to point to consumer. Now, I'd just like to point out, this is also going to flash back to the Hoffman and Novak computer-mediated communication. The broadcast model of Netflix is a one-to-many. Netflix hosts the content, the content is created, you as the audience watch it, but you don't respond back, you don't fire back, you don't interact. There's been some playing around with interactive game shows and interactive TV shows and there's some weird stuff out of the UK about um, late at night worth phone calls and calling into TV shows. It's, I don't know, I don't get it. But basically, this is one to many broadcast model, classic model, it's TV only on a computer screen. The next stop is the downloadable digital tangibles. Now, I'd like to mention here that because I do have an Envato license, I do use Envato, um, that I'm not getting endorsed. I pay them a monthly subscription fee to use the component parts. The little teaser trailer that we have, um, that little opening stinger snippet, those video 
moving video clips in there. They were all files I've downloaded and used as digital tangibles, merged in to my Adobe Premiere and create, I then created 14 or so of those different openers as standalone files. So there's a lot of digital tangible. For the most part, most TV networks want to try and keep you in the digital intangible. They want it to be streaming. So if you want to reuse or rewatch the episode, you have to pay it, continue paying the license access fee or you have to buy it again. In the middle, we have the transportable tangible. Um, yes, I made fun of it in audio because we're not making, there's less emphasis on making mixed CDs and mixed tapes these days. There's certainly a lot less emphasis on making mixed DVDs. But it is still a platform. I've been shopping in uh, Big W and yeah, discs, disc based medium is still a viable platform. It may be something of interest to you to whether your audience has a sort of retro or there's a product fit or product positioning fit for you to make your content available over physical media. And that can be a USB drive, it can be a DVD, it can be a CD. It may be the way to position yourself out and do a product differentiation. Think about it as a channel, as a mechanism. In the middle there is the mediated intangible, which I want to uh, point out that mediated intangible here, the VJ loops, it's close to the digital tangible in the sense that you are probably going to download a file to make use of the file. But the priority here is the brokerage. The idea that you are going to use a license. Now in this case, these are Creative Commons licenses. So there is an open reuse, attribution reuse arrangement. But where you pay somebody for the rights to use content on screen. And this is also something that gets mentioned in the Tom Scott. Uh, he has a particularly long and good video on why copyright is broken for the fact that to use individual images, like for me to slot a JPEG in that I don't own the copyright for, I'm already running close to the edge with these screenshots inside this video. It's very, copyright law has lots of problems, so it needs fixing. But functionally what you're doing here is you're engaging in a licensed behavior to reuse and redistribute certain pieces of content where the emphasis is on the license ahead of the actual object. So let's call, cover off a couple of case studies to close out the show. Now the big obvious one is for video platforms, TikTok, I assume at the time of recording, uh, that a number of people are running TikTok as their medium of choice. For me, TikTok hasn't resonated as a distribution platform. It's faster, sharper, and shorter than I want to do. But also, as we're going to discuss when we get into the paper for this week, it uses a certain market segment approach that doesn't fit me. It does have a very interesting psychographic profile, and it's one that we uh, will get into shortly. But also, it can be re-embedded in other platforms. So if you are thinking in terms of you'd like to use a video within your project, but you don't want to go to the full YouTube, you don't want a long content piece, uh, you don't have an Instagram or want an Instagram, but you just want to have a short platform, the TikTok might be the way to go. YouTube, our big bulky thousand pound gorilla in a much smaller sack. This is the, probably the most uh, widely used and best known of the video distribution channels. There are alternatives and there are other platforms. So whilst I use YouTube and I use it for content distribution, you don't have to. It also has some of the dumbest copyright problems in existence, immense amounts of automated stupidity through the Google algorithms, and it's sort of limping along because it's creating enough 
incoherent value that we're all able to pull out something of co-created value ourselves but it should be better than it is and there's a lot of opportunity for it to, to mature into a much much better platform it's getting progressively worse uh, this is one of the things having used YouTube since 2011 a number of useful features have gone away because they were they were being misused by people that YouTube didn't want to support in their misuse. Compared to there's a lot of misuse of YouTube going on at the moment and YouTube is happy with them because they are driving various internal metrics that YouTube wants to, is currently using to justify funding and support. I think this is a platform that has yet to find its feet. I think that YouTube is going to get worse for a while yet and then it's going to actually have a a critical moment where it goes what is the value proposition we offer and it'll find its way back home because in part I think Twitch is going to murderize it's either going to get bought out by Google and the alphabet company is going to take it so it doesn't hurt YouTube anymore or Twitch is going to figure out how to slice out a big chunk of YouTube's potential. Now to differentiate, the one I see the, the significant point of variance between YouTube and Twitch is YouTube's very good at pre-recorded content. And I think that's YouTube's absolute golden strength and where it will find its true value. Twitch, I think, has the potential for the ephemeral. Um, basically, I think Twitch can grow up to being the radio station of video. Radio will save the video star here. By being live, by emphasizing content goes away, so you can stream and choose to save as the creator, or you can stream and choose to discard as the creator. So you can have live events that are digitally mediated in a one-to-many-to-one -one environment that don't have in perpetuity or permanency and I think that's going to be amazing because you think about it at the moment TV broadcasts sports TV broadcasts live music so twitch streaming of live concerts and twitch streaming of live sports twitch streaming st streaming of chat shows of news shows it's got a lot more potential than it's currently experiencing where I can see it going wrong, where I can see there being a value proposition error is if it tries to go away and drop games as a central part of its value proposition. Its very core is it was created to stream video games. If you decide then to make video games go away as a pivot, someone else will stream video games and they will take your audience. So only a small number of uh, video channels. Video is an area where you have a preference, you have a platform, and there are several major players that dominate proceedings at the moment. So to close out, what I'd like to do is I'd like to mention the, uh, I mentioned this briefly when we were talking about TikTok. But this paper was a major discovery for me. Because as someone who has been using the internet for a, a long time and as someone who creates video content and has an Instagram and creates Instagram content I was genuinely surprised that I didn't like TikTok and I've been kicking around the place trying to figure out why I didn't like TikTok oh well, the usual easiest explanation was to go ah oh, I'm just I just got old you know you kids and your top ticks get off my lawn but that's not true I got old but I really wanted to like the platform. I, I think as a platform, I think TikTok's amazing. I thought Vine was incredible. And again, TikTok hasn't yet to fully move through the product life cycle. So we don't know what's next. We don't know what one minute videos are capable of doing yet. We haven't seen the peak. So this is to me, it's an amazing platform. And it never resonated. And then I read this paper, and the paper talked about the different behavioral motivations for the use of TikTok. 
And then it came, that basically this hit like a sledgehammer over the back of the head, is I don't have an archiving behaviour. So there are the different, there's the use of a platform for social interaction, talking to others, and as you might have seen by the forum, I quite like using platforms for talking. Uh, I mediate a lot of my friendships over Facebook. Before that, it was news groups, IRC, live journal. I'm big on social interaction online. Escapism. I play a lot of video games. I watch a lot of YouTube channels. I like the idea of disconnecting uh, from the here and now to be embodied and embraced in flow state in someone else's content. Self-expression. I'm big on that. I create my own content. I make my own music. I, I, I created a category of consumer producer, the conducer class, to best describe how much I'm into self-expression because it describes what I was doing in making all this content. And then we got to archiving. And archiving is a sense of, uh, is a preservation of the, of the present. And archiving is the antithesis to my life choices. I, I absolutely hate keeping a to-done list. My to-do lists are always on whiteboards, so when something's done, it's erased and gone, and I'm on to the next thing. And I'm a constant perpetual motion, looking forward, moving forward event. I don't like to sit back and look backwards. And for all of you currently staring at the screen going, hey, reflective journal. Yes, I'm asking you to do a reflective journal because I think archiving is important, and I think you should find out if it's something that you like and should embrace, or it's something that you are good at and should embrace, or it's something that you are like me and you get to the end of it going, well, that's done. I've done several reflective journals and they, they have an enormous value in when they are a good fit for a market. And when they're not, sorry about making you find out that you're not a good fit. I don't archive. TikTok is driven by archiving. TikTok is driven by the capture of the moment. And it was such a relief to realize that I was a horrendously bad market fit on a psychographic variable, had nothing to do with me being an old man. It was everything to do with me not matching a key psychographic behavior, a key psychographic variable that led to the specific behavior of using TikTok. So read this paper because it's really useful for understanding the motives, the watch, share, or create motive. Uh, and I think you could take a lot of the motivation aspects of this paper and make use of it in your reflective portfolio and in your performance review. If you are creating, or basically, watch, share, or create, that is producer, consumer, prosumer, and conducer. But mostly producer, create, Prosumer, share, and consumer, watch. So really good paper for giving you a theoretical framework to explain your lived experience. And with that, if you need me, you know where to find me on the socials, apart from TikTok, on email, over the internet, via the Waddle connections, or in the forums. And with that, Yep, it's the video sign-off, so see you in the sequels.